And welcome back to Tomorrow. Now, before we get started with our interview with Dave Mastin, I wanted to give a huge shout-out to all of the patrons of Tomorrow who've helped to make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are people who've contributed $10 or more. They get access to absolutely everything. We've also got our Tomorrow producers. These are people who've contributed $5 or more. They're going to get access to After Dark and a bunch of other really great rewards. To find out those reward levels and how you can help crowdfund the shows of Tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. Long-time guest of the show, Dave Mastin. You're back on... Uh, welcome. Thank you for c driving down from the mythical lands of Mojave. <laughs> Me. So unusual, pleasant weather and everything. <laughs> it is weird. It is weird. Uh, so uh, for those who don't know, uh, who is Mastin Space Systems? So Mastin Space Systems is a small company up in Mojave. We've been, you know, like to say, we're the hipster uh, rocket company. <laughs> uh, we've been doing reusable since before it was cool. Uh, <laughs> you have. You did like the uh, Northrop Grumman Lunar Lander, oh, what are we calling it now? It's the yeah, Northrop Grumman Lunar Lander X Prize. They change it every the, year. It's the Lunar Lander Challenge as far sure. as I'm concerned. Um, and and it, was, it was a wonderful thing. Uh, we, back in 2009, we demonstrated a small rocket-powered vehicle uh, essentially doing what you would be doing on the moon, was a, a landing and then take off and land again. And the big things were it was be able to do two of them within a very short period of time. I think it was 45 minutes and do so, uh, I mean, that's two big, flights. As far as I know, no one's really done that yet, right? So you were landing mm -hmm. five years before any of the other big players were doing that. Yes. But you were also then reusing it within like an hour. Within, yeah, very short period of time, turn around and, and launch again. We've done uh, a number of times where we've done multiple flights in a single day. Um, I think our record is for uh, a flight period is like 12 flights in less than a week. Um, that's pretty, that's, that's, that's a pretty good vehicle. number, yeah. That's a pretty good number. So, uh, hipster company. So, anyway, since we've been doing reusable for so long, we've now been working on uh, launch vehicles uh, with DARPA and uh, doing the XS-1 program. And this is, the XS-1 program is, is DARPA wants to do not just a reusable launch vehicle, but a launch vehicle that is truly airplane-like in operations. And one of the requirements is to do 10 flights in 10 days. We've already done that. Of course, they want a much larger vehicle than we've done before, a little higher performance. So, you know, for our competitors, uh, Northrop Grumman and Boeing, their challenge is to actually get a reusable vehicle uh, and doing 10 flights in 10 days. They've already done the same size or bigger. Um, whereas for us, well, we've already done the 10 flights in 10 days. We just got to do a larger, more pro higher performance vehicle. But in that XS1, you're going to a higher altitude. You say more performance. That's what so, you mean. More, not just higher altitude, but a higher velocity as well. So yeah, XS1 is a full uh, go, take a satellite to orbit type launch vehicle. Um, where we, you know, we have not done that. We pretty much, pretty much suborbital vehicles, very low performance type vehicles up until now. And now we're working on this, you know, actually a launch vehicle. It's a small to medium size uh, launch vehicle. And Neuropilot in the chat room says, are you still working on winged re-entry vehicles? Uh, that's what this XS-1. So XS-1, our initial concept drawing that we gave out to the press and, and, and DARPA sent out to the press actually had wings on it. Mm -hmm. um, we have a different configuration. Um, I prefer to think of them as fins. <laughs> um, but they're kind of large even for fins. But yeah, we do need some amount of aerodynamic surfaces for what we're trying to do with it in terms of uh, basically doing the reusability and, and still maintain some performance uh, levels. So have you changed the orientation of launch or landing then? Is it, is we it... still do vertical takeoff, vertical landing. That is, Mastin will not do anything but. Hmm. Um, you just, you can't land horizontally or take off horizontally from the surface of the moon. Sure. So why do I want to do that anywhere else? That's right. Uh, Newer Pilot also asks, is Lynx still a partner, or is that all dead in the water? Uh, so X-Core was a partner for the XS-1 in the early parts of phase one. Um, but what they were doing was they were literally just a, um, uh, um, how to say, uh, they, they, they were the what to do in case some of our technology development didn't go as well as we expected. Um, so there, there was sort of a redundancy uh, level to it. And uh, we got to a point in phase one where DARPA agreed with us that we actually had uh, bought down enough of the risk that we didn't need to carry an, a, another performer along with us to, to mitigate that risk. Um, so they're no longer, they, so, you know, basically they did what they needed to do, which was come in and, and, and do some of the work and make sure that we didn't have 
some technology risks, and we got to a point where we didn't have those technology risks, and so we said, oh, hey, you did a great job. Thank you for uh, helping us out, and uh, have a nice day. <laughs> well, they, they kind of have met, they, they're not totally gone, x -Corp, but they kind of met the same fate that a lot of new space companies meet, which is uh, a lack of funding, and uh, it seems like they've kind of really shut down their Lynx program, which was their reusable space plane, uh, so they're kind of moving on but you seem to be doing all right yeah we're doing we're doing okay so far <laughs> we're holding on um and uh you know and it's basically i think we found we found a little niche that gives us enough money to keep going um and, and we actually have you know customers which helps and, and are actually able to to fly those missions in fact uh, one of those missions uh actually a series of missions that we flew for jpl has resulted in the technology that we were helping jpl test get selected for Mars 2020. Oh, which is the uh, basically so, Curiosity Reborn. Yeah, curi the, uh, the next uh, Curiosity mission, mm -hmm. essentially, uh, which we'll be launching in 2020. That's mm -hmm. Mars 2020. And uh, yeah, so that I have a little piece of technology going to Mars. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> well, not just going to Mars, landing on Mars. So right? landing on Mars, yes. Or Absolutely. created an impact crater. But we've already proven out the Sky Crane model, so we're but, pretty well, sure. Well, it's... It's some knock on wood here because <laughs> what we did was actually help them uh, test out some of the technology, uh, terrain relative navigation and hazard avoidance technologies that some of that is going to be used for the new mission. So hopefully it does enable a nice soft landing and doesn't mess up. And Why is that things. important? Why, why, why is terrain navigation important? So, for ter uh, so terrain relative navigation and hazard avoidance technologies are really important because we need to go someplace a little less boring. On Mars, because <laughs> we're choosing flat areas that we can easily Huge land. Huge flat areas that you can easily land on just are not apparently they're not scientifically exciting. The exciting stuff is where you have, you know, maybe uh, you know deep canyons where water may have once gone. Uh, that's a little more interesting. You know, apparently geologists think the mountains and canyons and ravines are interesting. Um, so we need to see that type of of. Uh, that type of geology and, and that geography. So we need to be able to land in a much tighter band. You know, that, that, that landing ellipse needs to be brought down in size. And once you have a smaller landing ellipse, then we can do a lot more science with that. And that's terrain relative navigation hazard avoidance should enable that. So uh, there was a tweet um, when we announced that you were coming on the show. It was like, oh, hope they don't talk about hiking. Because you, you, you and your wife love to hike and, and go. Uh, so let's talk about hiking. So um, <laughs> exploration. <laughs> exploration, right? Exploration I mean, is how I like to call th it. Th that's what it is, though, right? I mean, what you're, you're talking about hazard avoidance, but you're going to need this on the vehicles that are landing on Mars because, you know, we're, for a long time we're not going to have humans on board. But even when we do have humans on board, autonomous landing is, is a good idea. And then you have intention of going to Mars yourself. I, I would love to go to Mars. I'd love to, um, so I consider myself an explorer. I'm not the pioneer. I'm not the guy who's going to go there and stay. I do have no intention of staying on Mars when I get there. I want to come home. So I'm going to go there. I'm going to survey. I would love to survey Elon's retirement home. <laughs> and when I get done with the survey, I'm going to you know, maybe hike around, maybe explore some mountains. Uh, you know, that hiking and mountaineering stuff that I do is, you know, there's the largest mountain in the solar system, so let's go hike to the top of it. You mentioned something before the show that I didn't know. The top of Olympus Mons, which is the mountain on, on uh, Mars, on Mars. Wanna, um, is in space. It actually extends above the quote-unquote sensible atmosphere. So uh, you actually have more of the... So, you know, despite the hard vacuum of space, there is actually an atmosphere everywhere. It is the solar wind is what you're going to quote unquote feel is, mm -hmm. is what you have there. If you have the instrumentation to detect it, it's more of the solar wind than it is the Martian atmosphere at the top of Olympus Mons. So you're basically out in space on top of Olympus Mons. The, the other dirty little secret is climbing Olympus Mons. Uh, once you're at the edge of it, apparently at the base of it yeah. uh, is like just a very long and it's uh, a long gradual easy to walk up slope it is not mountaineering <laughs> at all <laughs> and then when you're at the top you can feel that solar breeze <laughs> rushing against your helmet i guess at that point right right <laughs> yeah. uh, so you're going to go there and you're going to come back are you going to go there and come back on a Maston vehicle 
I would hope so. Uh, so and, you know, that's that's what we're working towards. Uh, so to that end, uh, what uh, Jack asks, what is the ultimate goal of Mass and Space Systems? Um, so the ultimate goal of Mass and Space Systems is we're a space transportation company. Uh, it is our intention to have provide the transportation services anywhere in the solar system. If you're going to a solid body or maybe even a liquid surface, we'll take you there. Uh, and it doesn't matter where in the solar system. Maybe even outside the solar system, too. Interesting. I feel like I should poke at that a little <laughs> bit. <laughs> um, well, I mean, you know, hopefully someday we'll figure out how to go, um, you know, get to the higher performance uh, rocket engines and, uh, you know, maybe figure out fusion or fission or something and, and get some higher performance. And, and you know, there, there is a, uh, an effort of, darn it, I can't remember his name now, Russian billionaire who wants to send, uh, send little tiny spacecraft to, uh, um, to Alpha Centauri. Love to help him with that. <laughs> so that leads into another question from uh, user Little Blind Crippled Girl who asks, what is your dream rocket? Uh, can it do like three flights a day? Is it, what kind of load can it do to low Earth orbit on a daily basis? What's like the Dave, Dave Mastin, budget is no constraint, time is no constraint. You can build it. What's your dream rocket? Um, I know, the two things that are always the huge constraints that keep everything down. But let's eliminate them for a moment. <laughs> um, so I don't know that I have a single dream rocket. There's, it's sort of like, what's your dream car? Well, I'm in the transportation industry. Do you know, mm. um, For certain routes, you know, think, think United Airlines. For certain routes, use Canada's uh, Canadair regional jets. For other routes, you're using 747s. And, you know, there are routes with everything in between. We're, we see the same thing. We, there are certain places where, you know, a small sat launch vehicle is the perfect thing to do and makes sense, and so that's what we'll do. In other places, you know, we need something where, you know, even Elon's not thinking big enough. Hmm. Um, but that's, you know, that's somewhere way down the line. And, that's and, a pretty big rocket. That's, yeah. a, that's a large statement. So, you know, that's... but. Uh, you know, who knows where, where that will end up being. You know, do we need, do we need you know, think about it. There's uh, little tiny tank trucks that, you know, go from gas station, from, you know, uh, refilling facilities, the tank facilities out to gas stations. Those are 5,000 gallon. You also have super tankers that are hundreds of thousands of, yeah, millions of gallons of, uh, of petroleum at a time. You need the whole range of things, so you know. I think we're going to need to do the whole range. You of mentioned things. a super tanker, so I have to mention the tweet that you <laughs> sent out, uh, which was uh, you were out looking at a what was it an Atlas or Delta launch? Uh, it was a launch of sorts uh, with your team, and mentioned uh, you may have figured out how to turn a super tanker into a rocket. It was it was you know it's a Friday Friday afternoon, bunch of guys around the water cooler talking. And recent, re, uh, might have been an Atlas V, I think, sure. launch. I don't, I don't recall. But yeah, um, and I just was like, what is the propellant mass fraction of a super tanker? At which point, somebody else jumped on Google and started looking and was like, um, about 80%. 80%. Well, that's that's pretty close to, you know, reasonable rocket range. You know, normally it's 90%. Well, that does include the diesel engines. So we take out the diesel engines and we put <laughs> rocket engines in instead. And rocket engines have this thrust to weight ratio and you'll need about this amount of thrust. And the next thing you know, we've got a concept designed for a rocket based on a super tanker. <laughs> now, that's uh, very similar to something that we've brought up on the show before, which is Sea Dragon. Uh, would there, is, it, is this you guys just talking like, hey, wouldn't this be neat, or do you think there's actually something there? So I, I'm not sure that I, 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 there's a number of questions that still need to be answered. There's maybe there's something there. Maybe maybe something that big really does need to occur. Um, and uh, so yeah, I mean we basically just you know sort of an afternoon, a group of guys thinking about what does what does a concept design like that look like. And, there's still some questions, but maybe uh, maybe it's not too uh, unreasonable. <laughs> would you? So if if you were thinking about it, you, you float it out to sea and then like tip it down like you would sea launch, would you? Oh, uh, that was one, one of our guys was like, yeah, you know, we could use our Zeus technology that you know where we land a a centaur on its side, and so you have your side thrusters plus you have your main engines. So maybe you take it out to sea, and when you get out to where you know you've got your 
your trajectory doesn't cross over land, you need, and you're pointed at the right inclination, you need, and maybe you're down at the equator. Um, you can, you can uh, light the, the engines up in the front, and you can basically pop a wheelie, <laughs> light your main engines, and get going. <laughs> I want to see that. That would be amazing. Oh, that, that would be amazing. <laughs> Just being a little much smaller vessel out at sea, like, oh, that's a very large. Are they firing rocket engines? <laughs> uh, yeah, there's some there's some serious questions about that. But you know, it was a controls guy, so if the controls guy thinks it can be done. It might actually not be. <laughs> oh my god, I would I would love to see you working out that in the middle of the Mojave Desert, just this giant super tanker. Uh, with like the Mastin logo and a pirate flag on top or something like that. Uh, uh, the pirate flag comes after we raise up the battleship Yamato ah. and make the, turn that into <laughs> yep. a spaceship. All right. Uh, uh, for those who grew up in the 70s. <coughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, uh, going backwards in time a little bit, Destructure1701 says, in the chat room, there are a lot of questions about MXP351. This is the first I've heard of it. Please describe it. Okay. So um, I'm not going to give you as much description as you want. It's a uh, hypergolic. Uh, propellant combination. It is green um, for whatever definition of green you, we want. It's ba but basically, it's really about um, we. You don't need the full scape suit when you're handling the propellants like you do with the traditional hypergols. Um, you can. You still need some protective equipment. So, for those um, who don't know, hypergolic uh, fuels will basically react with. Anything like water. I mean. So, well, hypergolic means that, that you have the, the oxidizer component and the fuel component, and when they touch, they ignite. You don't need an igniter. You don't need an igniter. It's, it's they will ignite, they will, it, you, and what the satellite industry loves about that is that you, they touch, they will ignite, you will, <laughs> your engine is going. <laughs> they love that you don't need an igniter. You don't have a point of failure yeah, out in you, space. You don't have a point of failure when you're out in space. They're extremely reliable. So, We've come up with a combination. We've been working. This is uh, a lot of the work has been done in conjunction with NASA on the Catalyst program, um, and we've basically worked out a way of getting these two particular uh, chemicals. Uh, they come together. They they ignite. They're actually very easy to handle. Um, instead of a full scape suit, all you need to do is basically wear eye protection um, and gloves. Uh, we do uh, one of the uh, an MSDS for one of the things said maybe you might want to wear a respirator. Eh. So we said okay, we'll wear a respirator. Not a big deal. Um, so, but uh, generally, it's, it's uh, the stuff is non toxic. You can handle it. If you were to inhale it, you're not going to die in the next couple of seconds. You don't have to go to the hospital. Um, if you if well, you wait. If you inhale a hypergol like today, there is not going to a hospital, right? I mean, you're you're. Basically... It depends on which of those two you you inhale. All right. One All of right. them, one of them, you're pretty much dead. You're gone. Forget right. it. The other one, you may have to go to the hospital. I guess that's one I'm chance. I'm used to work or considering with aerospace, right? It basically will react with anything. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it will react with anything, including <laughs> the tissues in your lungs. Right. And yeah, water. Exactly, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. It's right. not a it's not a fun thing. Um. Yeah. The the uh, the hydrazine is not necessarily. A, a terrible thing. I've, I've understand that some people have accidentally breathed hydrazine and are talking about it. Hmm. Um, on the other hand, the uh, the red fumic nitric acid is uh, a little bit worse. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's it's, it's the it, and there's a lot of details because we don't actually use hydrazine. It's more like uh, aerozine, which is some weird combination of hydrazine and other things that makes it worse. <laughs> so. Um, uh it's much greener, so better for the environment, because traditionally hypergols are not super awesome. Actually, you, you see like space disasters, and they tell you don't go anywhere near their vehicle. It's very toxic. That's generally the hypergolic fuels. Um, so it's green, uh, but what about, uh, it's easier to work with, so it's safer, yep. uh, but are there any words on like price? Is it less expensive? Is it more expensive, or is that irrelevant? Um, well, um, just because it's easier to work with mm -hmm. makes it less expensive. Okay. The actual cost of buying the chemical is is in the noise compared to the cost of actually loading it onto a satellite um, and actually working with it. So yeah, it's it's because it's easier to work with, it makes it a lot cheaper. All right, uh, let's move even further backwards, uh, kind of to the, back, the beginning of the interview because we're jumping all around with the chat room. Okay. Uh, uh, a vax headroom was, what is the maximum altitude you've achieved with your vehicles and how long uh, can you provide a flight in micro, uh, can a flight provide microgravity? Um, so how so, long can you stay in? in so space? we haven't actually we haven't actually gotten to microgravity levels yet. Um, our highest flight, shoot, 
we just had this discussion in an email conversation. We were like trying to figure out what our highest uh, altitude was because we think we we came very close to it uh, this past week. Um, I want to say it's around successful flight is around 500 meters. But it's not, you know, we, so hear, foot. we hear Elon and SpaceX talk about this a lot. It's, it's not the altitude, it's the velocity that is the hard part, right? Because you're talking about doing low Earth orbit, you know, low Earth orbit missions with like XS-1. That's not height, that's speed. Yeah, it's all about the velocity at that point. And, and to a certain extent, um, up to a point, uh, say 100 kilometers or so, um, or, you know, orbital velocities, up to about, you know, getting to the edge of space, it's speed and height are one and the same. Once you're starting to go to orbit, then it's all about the velocity after that. Um, and, and altitude has little to do with it. But that impacts your recoverability as well, right? I mean, that, that, that's, yeah. what, that's what makes reusability, I mean, you're, you're known for reusability, but this is, a, this is a nut that you haven't cracked yet, is it, is it not? So, so it is something that we haven't, yeah, we haven't gone the really fast yet. We haven't done the really fast. Um, but, I mean, there, there's a lot of different things you have to deal with for reusability. Um, one of the things is, can you even get a rocket engine to light, shut down, light again, hmm. um, repeatedly? And then how often can you repeat that before you have to take it apart and do maintenance? You know, between shuttle flights, that was one of the things. Now, um, early in the pro shuttle program, they absolutely positively had to take the shuttle engines apart and rebuild them every single time. Hmm. Um, now, my understanding is by the end of the program, um, by the time they retired shuttle, they did, but they really didn't have to take the engines off. Like, they took them apart, they, they checked it out, rebuilt it, but they really didn't have the wear and tear. So, like, maybe they're thinking, hey, you know, maybe we are getting to a level of reusability um, that might be, you know, more like an airplane where you land. You don't, you don't tear apart an airplane engine every time you land. Right. You know, so... Um, and so that's an interesting question. And I, you know, I don't know, you know, SpaceX and, and uh, Blue Origin, have, how much time do they spend on engine rework after they land? You know, are they just inspecting or do they have to clean the heck out of them? Mm -hmm. um, and, or, you know, or even tear them apart and rebuild them. Um, how about you? How much time? I mean, obviously you're being able to fly within 45 minutes, so I have to assume the answer is like zero. We figured it out to where you don't have to take apart an engine. You don't have to, you know, you just sort of look at it and say, yeah, that still looks like an engine. So what is, uh, this is from Tarantula, what is the biggest challenge for quick turnaround of your reusable vehicles then? So I think the biggest challenges are in the, um, the propulsion system. Um, and then uh, once you start doing things like going to space, um, and doing much higher velocities, uh, thermal protection systems. Hmm. Making uh, sure that you don't burn up. Don't burn up on re-entry, yeah. And uh, that's, that's sort of the hard part. That's sort of the, the, the part that we need a lot more work on, quite frankly. It's, Why is it hard? I thought, it feels like there are a billion different ter thermal protection systems. You got the tiles from the shuttle, you got blankets, you've got PICA from NASA. I mean, what, So you have things like PICA from NASA, which aren't so reusable. It's ablative. Sure. And so by definition, you're burning up a portion of it as you, as you come in. Maybe you can reuse it a second or third time if it if the reentry wasn't as bad as you expected. Um, but you really need something where you're not going to replace it after every flight or every two flights or every you know you don't want to replace it until after you've done a few hundred flights, and that becomes difficult. Now on the shuttle, uh, the shuttle used a lot of what um, uh, RCC. Um, let's say a carbon-carbon composite. Mm -hmm. And it had the problem of if you, you know, the reentry part might go just perfectly fine. It lost a lot of tiles. Um, they had constant problems with uh, losing tiles, so that's a bit of an issue. Um, so you had that replacement work. But also you, you know, you couldn't land in the rain because just a raindrop hitting it, it was going fast enough. And the carbon composite, the carbon-carbon is so brittle that a raindrop hitting it will crack it. Oh my gosh, I had no idea. I did not know they could not land in the rain. So yeah, they couldn't land in the rain. That's why they oftentimes had to land at Edwards. Huh. Is because, oh, it looks like it's gonna rain and it's going to keep raining through our entry window, so let's shift to Edwards so that you, we can land this mission. And that one time at White Sands. They and landed one, there, and one, one time they at They landed there yes. once and they said, we're never doing that again. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so that, so yeah, and, and so there's a lot of materials issues with thermal protection systems for doing a re-entry. And, uh, and uh, I think we actually have some, uh, 
some answers for that. I'm excited to see that in the future when that, uh, so, do you have any, are you allowed, are you able to give out any timelines? Because I know that XS1, uh, you know, the, the DARPA, they kind of did their, it's done in phases, and the first phase yep. is basically done, and we're kind of waiting on phase two. Right, uh, right. Are you going to move, I mean, like, do you need them to do phase two, or can you just continue moving forward without that? What, um, well, whatever, whatever their ultimate decisions are, we're going to keep moving. Um, we may change direction a little bit, like we might change the size of the vehicle. Um, not sure that, I mean, DARPA's, DARPA's XS1 vehicle may be a little larger than what we really, really, really want to do. Mm. So Okay, so what do you really, really want to do then? So right now, I really, really want to concentrate on small sat okay. launch. Um, I think there's a really nice um, opening there, and that's... Yeah, how, how large is a small set? What do you what do you define as a small set? Um, well, traditionally, small set is anything that's 100 kilograms or less. All right. Um, for a satellite size, I'm stretching that a little bit. I think maybe 250 kilos, 300 kilos is probably the uh, a sweeter spot for launch capability. All right. Um, but generally, you know, looking at most of the market is less than 100 kilos. There's enough of the between 100 and 300 that we think that makes a more sensible size. And what are you working on with XS1? So XS1 was uh, 3,000 to 5,000 pounds to orbit, so about uh, 1,400 or so kilos. So quite a bit more. So quite a bit more. Mm -hmm. um, and, but that's all, uh, XS1 is single stage to orbit. Re well, it doesn't no, have it to be. No, no, no. It, but it's definitely reusable. It is definitely reusable. Do If you did multi-stage to orbit, do all stages need to be no. reusable? No, it's ah. just a booster stage for XS1. Interesting. Interesting. And, uh, I didn't realize that. And that, that was sort of another thing that that's the, you know sort of another change there is like want to make that upper stage reusable. Hmm. Um, and so there is a little bit of a. Uh, you know, well, because in your in your initial drawings it looked like you were single stage to orbit, like with the the wing diversion, right? The giant airplane. So we had the wing, thing. but it was yeah it was a booster. So there was when XS1 program started, there were two missions for it. There was the go to orbit, mm -hmm. and it was also a do a Mach 10. Scramjet kind of ve a vehicle that could carry a scramjet experiment. Okay. Um, so basically, hypersonic experiments for the Air Force. The Air Force is really interested in doing a lot more testing in hypersonic environments, and they thought that, you know, if you could go to orbit, then well, obviously you can do a Mach 10 hypersonic experiment. As we got through the program, well, no, that's not really true. You really want to dedicate a vehicle for hypersonics. And it's either for launch or it's for hypersonics. You're really not going to do the same vehicle for both. Hmm. So they sort of dropped the hypersonic requirement towards the end. And then you would actually take it, if phase two doesn't happen or if you're not selected, you would take it and scale it down even more. We're just going to scale it smaller. down and do our own. Because you want to be fully reusable, that's what yeah. Massive Yes, Space exactly. Does. So uh, here's an interesting comment um, from Lars von Braun, uh, maybe you can speak to. It says, I really want to like Mass and Space Systems, but I feel like they're not very far along. feels like they're more dreamers than anything else at this time. Uh, are you just talking about this stuff? Are you building this stuff? Where are you? Because well, we don't hear a lot about you, we're right? We're building stuff. We're launching stuff. Um, you know, we're not, we're not billionaires. We're not, we're not backed by a billionaire, so it's just taking a little bit more time for us to do stuff. Um, and unfortunately, because, we're, because the government has been helping us with uh, you know, contracts for our launch vehicle, we're getting a lot of assistance from DARPA through the XS1 program to do a launch vehicle, then yeah, um, guess what? We can't tweet about it. Well, we can, but in order to tweet about something exciting that we did for XS1, for example, we recently did some engine testing um, for XS1. In order to tweet about it, I have to put in a request for media release to the bureaucracy. Feels like it feels like it's hilarious that you 140 characters you have to have this request. Yes, <laughs> and two weeks later, I get a question about it. I, you know, social media nowadays is you have a four-hour relevancy window. Sure. You know, if, if you're not talking, if you don't tweet it out in four hours, you're not relevant. So, if I got to wait two weeks, forget it. So, our, our social media is just, you know, taking a dive. Basically, I think we pretty much tweet about uh, being on tomorrow, and uh, we tweet about um, job openings. <laughs> 
So you're, you're kind of, uh, uh, for lack of a better term, in blue origin mode right now where uh, you're doing a lot of stuff, but no one can see what you're doing. Exactly. And then someday, once you're able to do it, these floodgates will open and be like, oh, actually, we have all of these vehicles. Because you have engines, you are flying things, you're making stuff, you're bending hardware, you're not just talking about it. You actually have a whole campus now up in... Yeah, we have a whole campus. We have five buildings now. Um, you know, our staff has grown considerably. We're about three or four times what we were a couple of years ago. Um, and we're doing a lot of cool stuff, but because we're working a lot more with the government, we're actually getting government contracts to support a lot of our development activities. You know, we have to go through this whole long spiel for getting stuff, you know, to tweet about stuff, and so it doesn't get us talked about as much. And, and you just sort of, well, let's, you know, let's keep working. We can do that. <laughs> they don't stop us from doing that. All right, uh, a couple last questions. Uh, we're going to bounce around a little bit again. Uh, one more is uh, that you really got the chat room all riled up over uh, MXP351. Uh, so if, if you can, yeah, I know, you're like, oh, God, don't ask this question. Uh, uh, don't answer it if you can't, but uh, we determined it's cheaper, safer, uh, but can you produce it off of Earth? So let's say you go to Mars and you want to build a vehicle and refuel it on Mars. Could you go to Mars and create it there from only elements found on Mars? Well, I mean, technically it is, you know, elements that are found just about everywhere in the universe. So, yes, we could. Um, how much effort would it take? I don't, I don't know. I mean, it's probably not as easy as just cracking water to get hydrogen and oxygen. Hmm. Um, although one of the components, uh, pretty much if you have water, we can make you one of the components. So, um, but, yeah, no, I... I, I you could. That's a solid All the maybe. elements are there. It's, <laughs> but it is, you know, I mean, question, I mean, we don't have any technology to make propellants off Earth right now anyway. So, That's you know, fair. no, you, you can't. Um, and I don't care if, if it's like or not. Um, but theoretically, you could. Just, but no, I don't think anybody actually has that technology right now. All right, this is a great question to take us into break. So this will be the last question for you. This one's easy, I promise. Uh, <laughs> and that is from Dr. Structure 1701. Do you have any job openings right now? I don't think we're hiring right at the moment. But if you, uh, if you do in the future, where should people go for that information? In the future, uh, Maston.Aero, A-E-R-O. Um, Did you know that there's a dot .space uh, top-level domain now? You can actually own Maston.Space? Um, I'll make sure to uh, let, uh, <laughs> let our, our people know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, we, found, we found that out the other day. So, yeah, there is a whole new slew of things. So I think that'd be pretty cool. All right, Dave, it is always fun having you on the show. Thank you so much. Uh, hopefully, hopefully that was uh, not too painful. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. Thank you. <laughs>